we have Lewis on the show and Lewis covers the Raptors so closely that we would be remiss to not ask some questions about the season at large and kind of try to wrap up this, what has been a really crazy, awful 2020, 21 season. So uh, we have some questions here and like, obviously all of these questions come with the um, disclaimer, I guess that like, the Raptors have been banged up. They've dealt with COVID. They're in Tampa Bay. So all of these things have affected their gameplay, I think, in significant ways. And, like, we could never try to guess how or why or whatever. But, yeah, like, that exists in the background and it shadows whatever has happened this season. But at the same time, there's you can draw enough conclusions based on what we have seen. I mean, it's hard because the core yeah. group has not been healthy very much together so it's hard to draw conclusions but um we're going to have to try so i guess i'll start off on the offensive end um because this is just something that i've found kind of funny all season is like when people say the raptors have been you know they're always in close games like they're they're always making it to the last minute like Mm -hmm. they're such a good team at at keeping it close and keeping it competitive. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't think you realize that that's like the negative side of that is that they can't win close games. Like, I don't think that's being talked about enough, you know? Mm -hmm. And I I, I guess I'm wondering, like, do you think that this group as currently constructed can become like a much better, like top uh, team in the clutch? Like their execution this year was just terrible. They didn't have the two veteran centers that they had last year that they could run stuff through and who would make good decisions. And it was just a mess of time. And often like Siakam got blamed because he was the guy taking the last shot, but it's on the coaching staff and I think it's on the core group. So do you think that this team can be good in the clutch? Yeah, I think, I mean, not only do I think they can, I know they can because they were in 1920. Like they were one of the best few teams in the clutch. Uh, obviously, losing Gasol and Ibaka hurts that a lot. Um, the 1920 take- season, by the way, guys, he, he doesn't mean the year 1920 because I know that's oh, going to be yeah. commented in effect. The Raptors the weren't Toronto there Huskies. in 1920. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm talking about the Toronto Huskies, obviously. <laughs> um, but yeah, and uh, taking the ball out of Kyle's hands impacts that a lot as well. I think, uh, and I don't have the numbers to back this up like my other point, but, um, you know, just my my eye test was that Kyle had a lot of the ball closing uh, last year, 2019 to 2020, and that shifted a lot to Pascal this season, uh, you know, with with bumps in the rope, obviously. As and you know, Fred as well, I will say. Yeah. Fred also Fred, got a lot more of those possessions. Fred, we know, can close. Fred has closed NBA Finals games with the ball in his mm-hmm. hands, running pick and roll against the Golden State Warriors. I mean, Fred, I am totally confident as a second side, you know, initiator. Uh, but yeah, they, I think they can be good. I think a lot of the clutch stuff is probably overblown just because they were in so many, and it's just so chancy. Just like, yeah. does one shot go down? It impacts the numbers to such an extent. Um, most likely, they shouldn't be in that many games. I mean, they had really good net ratings with their core four in games. When mm-hmm. Kyle, Fred, Pascal, and OG were playing, they were a really good team, like fourth seed in the East good. Uh, those teams don't play as many games in the clutch. So I think it probably would have changed not only what we're talking about, but how we're talking about it. Uh, if the season would be different. So I'm a little less concerned, I think, than you, although Pascal will be the guy with the ball and, as you said, did not deliver in a lot of games. Yeah, no, I was going to mention um, the clutch thing has been something that's been talked about. Oren's, Oren's right. Like, I've seen it all over Raptors Twitter for the entire season. I've seen it over and over again, and a lot of people have been all over Pascal Siakam. He's been... I don't even want to say the scapegoat, but he's been the main attraction um, and not in a, a positive way to be, to be quite honest with you, but to be fair to Pascal, like he's been pretty unlucky. Like Lewis is right. This is a chancy thing. How many in and outs did we see from Pascal Siakam this season? How many, I think six, seven in clutch moments. Like, um, and we're talking like halfway through the hoop too. This isn't just like a rattle. This is a Pascal's just 
goodness gracious. And it's not, it's, and it's been at every level too. Every level of the court. It's been at the three point line. He's gotten an in and out. He's gotten a couple in and outs on floaters. He's driven to the hoop in and out. So I don't know, man. I, I've seen Pascal. Um, I've seen him do some really good things in the clutch this season, last season, season prior to that, when Kawhi Leonard was there. Um, we've seen him do things on the biggest stage in the finals. And I think, as weird as this sounds, the clutch, I think, I'm not sure, or I mean, uh, Oren or Lewis, honestly, if, if the clutch is, is it the last five minutes? Is that how it is? That how it is or is it the last two minutes? Five, uh, five minutes general. within five points. So it's five minutes within five points. So I think, as weird as this sounds, when you're in the NBA Finals, almost every bucket, this sounds very cliche, but I think every bucket from when the game starts is a, is a clutch moment. You're on the biggest stage. Everybody's watching. And Pascal Siakam dominated in the NBA Finals. And I hate to keep going back to the NBA Finals when people talk about Pascal, but I don't want people to just take what Pascal's done this season and make a, a, a you know, w- essentially wash over what he's done his, his entire career since he's been a prominent player for Toronto. I yeah. think... Pascal can't necessarily be uh, – I wouldn't call him a clutch player outright, but I also wouldn't call him unclutch. And I think Fred as well. Lewis mentioned Fred. Fred's done some pretty big things, man, for Toronto in the last few years as well. Um, Kyle, obviously, before Fred and Pascal even got here, Kyle was hitting clutch shots. So I don't think it's that big of a problem, Oren, but I think – it's definitely, I would lie to say it wasn't a talking point this entire season. Yeah, Pascal yeah. also has done it. I mean, less big stages. He did have that little step through floater in the finals. But also last year before COVID, he had two layup game winners against the, well, one was a game winner, against the Kings and the Warriors, I think, where he had drives and sort of offhand, like off wrong foot, wrong hand layup. Siakam? Yes, yeah. I think it was the Suns, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, it was the Suns. One of them was the Suns, because I remember Bridges, I think, was guarding him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And those are clutch plays, right? Like, obviously, he's missed a couple this year, but, you know, add in a couple makes last year, and it balances out. So I think it's just an unlucky year. I'm I'm not that worried. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys make good points. Like, the thing with taking the ball out of Kyle's hands, I think is an important part about this that people don't talk about, which is like not only in clutch time, but also just in general, Kyle's like touches per game, you know, his time per touch, all that stuff has gone down this season where Fred's has gone up and Mm -hmm. they're putting the ball in Fred's hands much more as like a de facto point guard. And that's more of a long-term play. It's like, we need to develop you in this mold and it, it might not lead to great results right away, but, in the future it could, but I mean, I think we're glossing over some of the things that Siakam has done this season because it's not just the scoring. It's, you know, these bad decisions he makes when he gets called for these charges. Right. And it, and it's this double dribble he did against the Knicks. Like there has been enough, like there's been enough bad stuff this season in the clutch with him that I, I think it's fair if you question his ability to be like, you know, a Kawhi Leonard where you're like, okay, here's the ball. Now we're going to get out of the way and you're going to ISO and hopefully you score. And like, I think he was never that guy and he was miscast as that guy. If, if they put him in that role a little bit too often. Um, But yeah, I think I, I agree that like, it could definitely like clutch is one of those things that can definitely change pretty quickly. And uh, I guess with a little luck and a a little more advantageous sets, but I don't know. It's coming to keep an eye on some. One more there. thing. One more thing, Oren, with the, with the clutch, um, the entire discussion surrounding this, these clutch time situations and all this. I think people get so caught up on the Raptors not necessarily having a quote unquote closer. I've heard this so many times. I'm actually seeing it in the comments now about how Siakam's not a closer, about how Kyle Lowry's not a closer, or um, Fred Van Fleet's not a closer. You you can't. There isn't that one guy, like Oren said, Kawhi. When the Clippers are in that situation, the game, the the, the ball, everything's on the line. What's that famous saying that Max Kellerman says? <laughs> Igudala. I says, want Igudala. <laughs> if the I don't know. Yeah. He says something about a death beam staring planet Earth in the in the face or something like that. Yeah. Max <laughs> Kellerman went on some crazy Igudala. Who was it over though? By the way, Oren, Steph I don't want to get too off track. It was over Steph, Steph Curry. Yeah. yeah. So that was just for ratings. 
Max Kellerman. Um, what was I saying? Um, I think it's actually advantageous for Toronto for the fact that they have three guys who have been in clutch situations who are not necessarily, again, quote-unquote closers, but guys who are able to hit clutch shots. And I think if you have a guy like Kyle Lowry, if you have a guy like Fred Van Vliet, and you have a guy like Pascal Siakam, my thing is you have three guys. I think you just take out of those three guys who has the hottest hand at that game. And I think that's a that's something that a lot of teams don't have. Like for the Bucks, I think the ball is going to Giannis no matter what. I mean, people wouldn't be shocked if it went to Chris Middleton. People would be kind of shocked, I guess, if it went to Drew Holiday. But naturally, you probably want the ball in Giannis's hands the most in the last two minutes, right? For the Clippers, it's Kawhi Leonard. Again, people wouldn't be shocked if it was Paul George. And and it goes on and on. For the Lakers, it's probably LeBron and AD, right? And I think for the Raptors, you have three guys who um, you can rely on and say, you know what, Fred, you've made this big shot before, and you are and you have 32 so far in the game. Kyle only has 18. Pascal has 20 and isn't shooting too well. Fred, this is going to be your shot tonight. And the next night, it could be Pascal. And the next night, it could be Kyle. A lot of teams don't have that. So... I'm okay with the Raptors, again, not having, quote-unquote, a closer um, to finish things off or to have that that superstar that can really just close whenever you need him to. 2018-19, um, it was Kawhi Leonard a lot of times for the Raptors in clutch moments, and, and a lot of times he delivered. And I think that's what opened people's eyes to, hey, the Raptors finally have a superstar in Toronto. Um and a lot of times, clutch moments, guys, are what separates superstars from stars. And I think now we're starting to realize with this season that Fred Van Fleet and Pascal Siakam are not superstars. Sometimes you really just got to say it out loud for people to truly understand that Fred and, and, and Pascal and Kyle right now at this moment are not superstars. They are all, all three are all-star level players, but they're not superstars. Um, but again, a, a lot of times you can't really say um, as a fan of a team that my team has three you know, all-star level players. And who knows, OG Ananobi might get there as well. I think that's fair. Um, But I also think like Siakam can be a number one option. Like I definitely don't shy away from that. I just, I just actually think Giannis is a good comparison of like, they have started to take the ball out of Giannis's hands a little bit late in the game and put it in Drew's hands and put it in Chris Mills's hands just because, you know, Giannis is, I guess, somewhat predictable and downhill player and not as much of a shooter. And I think, like, you could see that happen, or I could see that happen to Siakam where he's not the best clutch time guy, go get us a bucket, but he is a number one option throughout 48 minutes. And, like, that's fine if that's the case, right? Uh, no, that's that's totally fine for me. Some people in, in the in the chat or in the, and Lewis, they're saying Gary Trent Jr., Gary um that's another guy like are you really all that mad if the ball late in a game next year goes to gary Trent jr um i mean i'm not i'm not terrified i'm not he's he hit a pretty nice game winner this year i don't know if it was the raptors only game winning shot like truly game true game winning shot this year but i wouldn't be too bad if it was gary Trent jr either so um yeah I th- yeah i think the raptors are in good shape man if the ball starts in his hands, you probably don't want that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But that's I fair. Think that's the fair. The point is, it can't be a static set, right? Like, mm-hmm. this is what you're saying, Sahal. You know, if you just give the ball to Fred, if you just give it to Siakam and just stand around, that's not going to do it. Mm-hmm. And you could do that with with Kawhi. You can do that with LeBron. Mm-hmm. You know, so they they don't have a guy who can do that. It doesn't mean what they have don't doesn't work. You know, you can run inverted 4-1 pick and roll with Pascal handling Fred screening. Like, there's mm-hmm. options to get a good shot. It just takes a little more work. Um, so yeah. I think what you say is 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 wise in that they <laughs> don't have a guy the level of the closer they had, and it doesn't mean they can't close. Two things can be true at once. Yeah, and, okay. and, and this season, if anything, trying definitely happened. Like, they've tried it all, you know? <laughs> so I think, like, coming into next season, they will have a much better idea of what works and what doesn't. Um, but let's move on to another question. I guess we'll go... Um, let's talk about the defense, maybe, because, I mean, coming into the season, people thought the Raptors would probably keep their at least if not elite defense, they they would probably keep a top 10 defense for sure. And the half court offense was really the biggest question heading into the season. And 
we've seen a little bit of a reversal where if I'm correct, the Raptors offense is ahead of their defense right now as things stand. Um, they just haven't been very good defensively. Um, very inconsistent. Mm-hmm. One game they'll look very good and one game they'll look very bad. And I mean, a huge part of that was the center rotation and it got a, a whole lot better with Ken Birch. But I guess like, do you guys think that is enough? Do you think like Ken Birch in a starting role, if that's the case next season, is that a team that can be like a top 10 defense? Oh man, with Ken Birch, um, considering everyone else's health, um, being in good shape, I think, yeah, I think absolutely. I think a lot of people have, have um, had that question where it's like, if you bring back the core four of Kyle Lowry, you know, OG Pascal and Fred, and then that five spot, whoever it is, Ken Birch, or it could be, Another guy they bring in and Ken Birch is coming off the bench. I think you slot Ken Birch in there. Absolutely. I think a lot of it also comes down to can you get real defensive um, game changers off the bench? Can you do that? Because for Toronto a few years ago when Fred was coming off the bench in that Kawhi season where they were starting Danny Green, you had a guy come in and just be a menace in Fred off the bench. You had a couple of guys um, that could really change games off the bench. And now we're starting to see it. We saw at times an all NBA level defender in Fred this year. Um, and we know what we get in Pascal and OG. OG's one of the best wing defenders in the league. That's clear by now. He's gotten, I don't know necessarily Oren and Lewis, if he's gotten national, the true national attention he deserves. Some people have mentioned him. I know Zach Lowe has mentioned him. Um, some other, you know, prominent NBA writers have mentioned him on their podcast. But you have OG, you have Pascal. You have Kyle and Fred. And I think Kyle also, specifically with him, you can kind of, I want to say, imagine that a step back defensively is is bound to happen for Kyle. We kind of saw it this year as well, where he's not that 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 defensive ace that he used to be. I mean, it's normal. The guy's 35 years old. I would have expected it maybe two years ago with the amount of minutes he's been playing since, since he's been a Toronto Raptor. But who can you really bring off the bench um, that can that can change things? Utah has looked pretty damn good, you know, in the final, I want to say 15, 20 games of the season. They ran that, you know, box and one with him um, in multiple games. Stanley, yes, but a lot of times with Stanley offensively, it feels like you're going four on five. Um, Malachi, yes, but we'll see. I don't know. I think they can. I I definitely think they can be um, one of the NBA's best defensive teams, um, considering, again, assuming that there's full health all around the board. Not like this year, because this year a lot of guys are missing. Yeah, I'm going to double down on that and say they would have been a top 10 defensive team this year Yeah, yeah. if their guys had stayed healthy all year and they'd had Cam from the start. Uh, I mean, their their core four with Cam Birch had a net rating of 23, (laughs) which is like, you know, that's like that's Kobe Shaq in the 0-1 yeah. playoffs. Right, Net that's rating. plus 23 per 100 possessions, just to yeah. be clear, right? Not like a, we're not talking an overall net plus 23 together. Uh, no, that's offensive rating 123. Oh, offensive rating, rating. 100. Oh, exactly. sorry. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah. Outrageous. Yeah. Which is crazy. Um, and right. in 90 minutes, so not nothing, but like not a real sample. Mm-hmm. Um, I, their defense with Kem is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Like his defensive ability is maybe not quite what Mark gave, but in the same stratosphere, it was, it it was phenomenal when he was alongside Toronto's best defenders. Um, His, I think his ability to sniff stuff out was a little lower than Mark's. He was slower to the, to the floor to the punch. He didn't blitz quite as well. His hands are slower, but his athleticism is probably, I was thinking about this the other day, the most athletic center Toronto has had since, I don't know, Bebe? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, Lewis, he is so athletic. He covers space like a, like a cat. He's just a gazelle, bomb, you know? No. It's crazy. 100%. Uh, so top 10, no doubt. That's maybe even underselling how could they be, how good they could be defensively. Yeah. Um, I think Kyle took a step back this year in, uh, at the point of attack in terms of staying in front of his men. I yeah. don't think that's talked about enough, but which has been a trend for a few years. Okay, 
But Baines was really just so bad for the system that when you watch Cam Birch play, like I told, I agree with you guys. I was just kind World's of trying apart. to be devil's advocate. Like Cam Birch is such a sis, a perfect system fit for the Raptors because of his, his athleticism. He can go, he can double someone, he can get back to the post and get his guy or get a rebound. And then obviously there's the other stuff, the running in transition, you know, some of his dribble handoffs, like he can do a lot. But especially on the defensive end, I just love how quickly he can get from one place to the next. And, like, that's what we ask our centers to do. We don't ask them to drop and do yeah. some simple Ennis Cantor stuff. We ask them to hedge. We ask them to double team someone and then go find their rotation. And then maybe you need to find a third rotation within the same shot clock. Like, it's not an easy job. And Aaron Baines just wasn't the right guy for it. I think. You know, Aaron Baines isn't in a vacuum as bad as he was this season. He could probably play a drop and be okay on on a Portland kind of team. But yeah, I think I think Birch has made it very clear that he's a very good fit. But I also think like if this team wants to contend for a championship, it can't be Aaron Baines and like Gillespie, for example. It has to be two starter quality bigs like a, a Ibaka Gasol kind of split. I think that's how you, you either have an elite big or you have two really good bigs. I think that's the only really real way to contention other yeah. than maybe that OG Siakam front court that does deserve some more time to show what it has. Yeah. Kem reminds me a lot of Serge Ibaka with his defensive mobility. Um, and I see, you know, a lot of people bringing up how, Ken might, might not be strong enough. And I think that's okay in the system that Nick Nurse employs. I think it's okay because Kem's running back and forth. They're switching everything. They double team a lot in this defense. Um, Serge Ibaka a lot of times wasn't strong enough. He didn't have that core strength to deal with a, a Joel Embiid or a, or a Jokic down low by himself. And I think with the Raptors, that they don't ask you to do that, which is a good thing. Um, they don't ask you to just go one-on-one with, with Jokic all game. Uh, they had the luxury of doing that with with Marcus All a lot, you know, where they could just plug him on on Joel Embiid for and match minutes with Joel Embiid, and we saw what Marcus All has done to Joel Embiid and and guys like Nikola Vucevic. But um, yeah, they don't have that guy, but I think that's okay. I think that's fine. I think they can get away with that. Yeah, I guess that's what's so crazy about. Were you going to say something, Lewis? No, totally in agreement. Okay, yeah, I think yeah. that's what's so what crazy about Mark though when you like it just kind of connected with me but like most bigs who are that like you know that fluid and like can get to the position so well can't also deal with a post-up threat like joel and like that's what mark does and like that's the fair knock on chem is that he is not very good in the post his defense against like those type of bigs needs work but like you said like the system accounts for a bit of that. They will double team those guys. They're not afraid in the least to double team those guys. Um, Real quick, guys, let me ask you guys a question. Aaron Baines yeah. got, if I'm not mistaken, a two year, $14 um, million dollar contract from Toronto, right? Does, is, 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 has Ken Birch raised his level enough in his stint with Toronto where he could command that type of salary? Because that type of salary, it sounds like quite a bit, but really when you look at it relative to the rest of the league, Steven Adams is making $30 million this year. So would you guys be okay with a similar type of contract, even a longer contract? A lot of people want Ken Birch for three years um, in the offseason. What, what do you guys think Ken Birch is going to command? Uh, what region of, of, of money do you think he's going to get? Because I've seen everything, by the way. I've seen three million people throw up that. three. Yeah. Oh, you think more than that? More than seven? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think he... he is sort of played himself out of the the mid-level exception, Mm -hmm. um, which I think Aaron Baines took all of it, right, for the Raptors? He was the... I think he did, yeah. No, the Alex Len took like a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right, you're right. I totally forgot Alex Len was a Raptor. He played, and he's playing a lot right now for Washington. When was that, six years, seven years ago? I can't quite remember. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Uh, Yeah. Don't remind me. I think... Cam is probably outside of that. That would be, I mean, if, if Toronto gets him at seven a year, um, you know, that's surplus value that you can build a championship team with. That's crazy. Yeah. Are we looking I, at like I'm a Tristan Thompson contract, like a two year 19? 
Yeah, I think 10 that is... That sounds much more reasonable. I think 10. I think Derek Favors is, like, a pretty good example. He's, mm -hmm. I think he got a 10 by 3, if I'm correct, like a $30 million contract. Something like that. Um, but, I mean, it's going to be weird, like, how they choose to, you know, pay th this, this free agency because also, like... I mean, if he's the starter, then that's obviously fine. But if you pay a starter and then you also pick Cam 10, I'm not sure that's the best use of your resources when you consider that OG at the five yeah. could be the best lineup in a playoff series. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It'll be interesting. But uh, the last question I have, I'll go to you first, Lewis, is where are you at with Fred Van Vliet's playmaking? Because, I mean, from, from what I see, like... Mm -hmm. He started the season, like we talked about, he's been the point guard more often than not for the Raptors. They've clearly made it a point to give him the ball and make decisions. And I think he took like very significant steps early this season where we were like, oh, I didn't know he could do that. And then I think he might have hit somewhat of a wall at one point um, towards the middle late. And, and then the last few games he's played, I've seen him do some things that are like even higher level where the just things I have never seen him do before in terms of like looking off a defender and making a no look pass or, you know, those kind of things. So I guess where are you at with him and like, say they bring back Fred and no Kyle in the event, something like that happens. Like, does this team have enough playmaking without a Kyle Lowry? I think that's a, a really important question. Uh, I think probably yes. Uh, I'll be about the biggest Fred defender you'll find. In mm -hmm. fact, to the extent that for the vast majority of the season, not towards the end, Kyle was incredible. From yeah. about the COVID break on, Kyle really picked it up. But for the most of the season, Fred on ball was Toronto's best offense. Mm -hmm. um, he A lot of his passing comes down to whether he can score around the rim. When teams just short-circuit his actions – and say, beat us, score, and he can't, then his passing looked bad because they close all the passing gaps. They ask him to make a layup, and he can't. Um, and so a lot of his athleticism, if any of it is sapped from an injury, you know, that's when he gets those two, three assist games. Uh, you know, counterintuitively, you think it's the scoring that, that's affected, but he, he's such a good shooter, often he can score anyway. It's the passing that sort of shut down when he's hurt. Um, when he's healthy, I think he is, he is an elite point guard on ball creator. Uh, he's gotten better at passing for twos. Um, he's always been fantastic at passing for threes, hitting shooters. He's gotten a lot better at hitting rollers, hitting cutters. You yeah. know, he's not Kyle, but Kyle's been one of the best two or three point guard passers in the league for years. In the league. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like we're, we're spoiled and he mm -hmm. is very, very good. Yeah, no, I agree, hundred um, percent. I think with Fred, I've mentioned to Oren um, how you know on past shows how I'm kind of worried if Kyle moves on. I guess now seeing how much Malachi Flynn has has improved in such a short amount of time has me less worried about the point guard position. I'm kind of worried about the long term, the fit beside you know Fred Van Fleet and Gary Trent Jr. I'm, I'm I'm a little bit worried. I'm a little bit worried because Gary Trent Jr. to me should be used. He should be utilized mostly as a, as an off ball threat. I think on ball it's 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 not that he can't score, but he takes a lot of tough jumpers, man. Like he takes a lot of tough mid range jumpers that honestly you're shocked a lot of times when they go in. His um, diet is like a his... McDonald's, if you know, <laughs> because everything's hard to eat in terms of like. <laughs> your stomach but yeah it's, it's tough like yeah no watching Gary Trent Jr it's it's um I think it was much easier for the eyes to watch Norman Powell because of his ability to be that three level score Norman was so good at each level of the court offensively there was a point this season I know it, sound, it feels like years ago but Norman was just dropping 30 and then 35 and 40 and 28 and Gary Trent Jr had a very good scoring run himself but he just makes it look a little tougher um so I'm kind of worried with the fit with Fred and, and Gary Trent. That's why I really, really hope we get Kyle back um, for next year. Maybe we sign him to like a retirement contract. Again, Malachi makes me feel a little better, but 
I don't know, man. Fred's Fred's playmaking again. Lewis is right, man. Like Kyle Lowry has spoiled the absolute shit out of us. Like I'm being totally honest, he has spoiled us insanely because Kyle's again been one of the best passers in the league. And then watching Kyle for so many years at such a high usage, and then Fred Van Fleet comes in and we're, we're over diagnosing his playmaking. I think he's taking strides, man. He's taking strides, like Lewis said. So I'm okay, but. A little part of me is worried with the fit beside Gary Trent Jr. Hypothetically, if the Raptors do sign GTJ in the yeah, offseason. Yeah, sorry to, to jump in again. I just yeah, wanted yeah. to say one thing about that that I really agree with. Fred has smaller windows than a lot of point guards. Mm-hmm. The size, but also the finishing. And so often when other point guards will have like two dribbles to make a pass, Fred only has one. And so you need him to play along really heady guys. Like someone who can relocate immediately and know exactly where to be. Someone yep. who can just shoot back door to clear out space for a shooter behind him. Kyle is that. That's why Fred's mm-hmm. so good alongside Kyle. Gary Trent is not so much proven to be. So I, I completely agree with you that the fit may not be ideal there. 